I will get started. Welcome and good evening to all. Thank you so much for spending time this evening to be with us to learn more about the Hirsch Institute and implementation science in both practice and research. I'm Mary Delansky and I'm the Sarah Hirsch Endowed Professor from the Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing and the director of the Cusin Institute. I also work at the VA and the VA Quality Scholars Program, both nationally as the nurse advisor and locally as a senior nurse faculty. And so we are excited to bring this presentation to you all tonight. Before we get started though, I'd like to have uh, some housekeeping. Uh, the first housekeeping item is that if you'd like to uh, move your screen to the gallery view or the screen view so that you can just see the presenter and then the screen and the slides um, in your upper right hand corner, you can click on the speaker view there. And also um, for disclosures, we have no conflict of interest uh, for anyone planning or presenting this activity. And the learners who complete this activity will earn one credit contact hour. Criteria for successful completion would be to listen and interact during this webinar. And then following the webinar, a link to the evaluation form will appear in the chat box. Uh, complete that evaluation and submit it within two weeks, and you will receive an electronic certificate after submitting that evaluation. And as you all know, to print and save your certificate um, and keep it for six years for your records. Um, So with that, happy Nurses Month and happy Nurses First Day. Very exciting to be giving this presentation on May 6th, National Nurses Day. So congratulate or you know, um, happy day to all of you. Uh, the hands that turn caring into action, those that touch that turns compassion into comfort and smiles that turn love into healing. And this is the art of nursing. And thank you for all you do for our patients across the, the region here in Cleveland. And then also if anyone is any global, globally. So we celebrate with the American Nurses Association uh, now moving Nurses Week to Nurses Month, which is very exciting. And notably the American Nurses Association has some great pieces to share with us each week of this month. And the theme is nurses make the difference. And that is so true. You all make such a difference, um, particularly in the quality and the safety of care for our patients. Um, before we get started, I would like to just do a very brief reflection um, tribute to all of you. It has been a very, very rough year. We're looking you know, to some more difficult times ahead. Um, nursing uh, really is at the front line, making such a difference in our care that we deliver. And also a tribute to all of our friends or loved ones uh, or our patients who have passed away. Ah, strength to all of us. So welcome to this webinar tonight on the Sarah Cole Hirsch Institute from the Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing. And tonight we'll be looking at the Hirsch Institute history and then a brief orientation of implementation science, which is so very much needed now. And then opportunities for implementation practice and science or research into the future. So with that, I'll get started with the Hirsch Institute history. So the Sarah Cole Hirsch Institute for Best Practice for Best Nursing Practices Based on Evidence was made possible from the estate of Sarah or Sally Cole Hirsch. She was a dedicated nurse uh, and alumna. Uh, Sally Hirsch was a volunteer at the Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing, and from 1963 to 69, she served as a national chair of the University Medical Center Development Program and helped raise substantial funds for the construction of the building, the older building that we saw in that last picture, uh, that currently housed the nursing school. Um, Ms. Hirsch received in 1973 the first alumni award, and she continued to serve until her passing in 1997. So our first, or not the first director, but the first one I could find in our history was Elizabeth Madigan, who served as our interim director of the Hirsch Institute in 2006. And she did some really important connections with the online journal of uh, nursing issues in nursing, in which most of the Hirsch Institute repository or searches or systematic reviews for many important topics in nursing are archived. Uh, another director from the Hearst Institute was Catherine Jones, who directed it from 2007 to 2015, and she did an amazing job of providing 
certificate program for nurses in the region at both basic level and advanced level. And during these years, the big push was on evidence-based uh, um, systematic reviews and really uh, pulling the literature together to guide nurses in practice. And then the most recent director was Dr. Joachim Voss, and he was the director from 2015 to 2019, and he made some great contributions to evidence-based practice in HIV care management, and also did some very innovative things with this art and the also uh, comic books. And so in 2020, I became the director of the Hirsch Institute, and my, the vision that we are currently working with is to discover and disseminate and implement evidence-based practices with our academic and practice partners regionally. And our mission then is to serve as an interprofessional center for evidence-based practice implementation that really facilitates best practice uptake and transforms practice outcomes. So we really move the mission and the vision to more action-oriented implementation of the evidence into practice. With that, our aims are to provide contemporary expertise in this evidence-based practice implementation and quality improvement, which are very important uh, component of implementation of evidence into practice with the aim to improve quality and safety. Our another aim is for us to inspire the next generation of scientists and interprofessional research teams to engage in implementations research that is relevant to the needs of our clinical partners. And then our third aim is to provide forums and resources like tonight to enhance implementation of evidence-based practice through discovery and generation of new solutions in practice. And then the fourth aim is to promote learning and research in implementation science through lectures, courses, and conferences. And so we'll be having more of those into the future. So that's the history of the Sarah Cole Hirsch Institute. And now we'll move on to a brief overview of implementation science. With that, I'd like to do the first polling question. And that polling question is, how familiar are you with implementation science? Not familiar at all, somewhat familiar, or uh, you feel that you are an implementation scientist? There we go. All right. So everyone is answering the poll, and it looks like we do have about 75% of you who are somewhat familiar with implementation science. So that's really good to know. And I'll let Maria close the poll out. Shall I close it out, Maria, or? Uh, it is closed. I think you're going to have to close it on your screen. Oh, okay. So sorry about that. All right, there we go. So why? So why is implementation science needed now currently? And that's because of this translation pipeline, which has indicated that it takes about 17 years to move evidence into practice. Now, how does that trajectory look? If we start at the left of the screen, we can see that research and priorities for research start at the big open lens. And then we do peer review of grants, and then we complete our grants and do publications. And then we synthesize all this literature that we create, and then guidelines are created for us to implement that evidence into practice. And then finally, after 17 years, it drops into practice. However, we do know that much of the work doesn't even land into practice, um, and that is the, the huge gap in care delivery today. And so what is implementation science? Well, it's that scientific inquiry of the best strategies to promote that uptake of research findings and evidence-based practice into patient care with the goal of improving quality, safety, and efficacy of care. So again, it's helping us to understand the uptake of that research into practice. Here's another slide depicting this concept again. If you look at the bottom of the screen, um, in the stages of research, we'd see that we do pre-intervention studies, we do efficacy trials, we do effectiveness trials, and then we determine like we determine that there has some merit to this intervention. And then we again go into clinical practice guidelines and promote the uptake into practice. But again, we know that many times that uptake is slow and sometimes not even present. And therefore implementation 
science steps in. So you can see in the square or the rectangle at the top of the screen that implementation science includes exploration of those evidence into practice, that adoption of the intervention into practice. Finally, how the, the intervention is implemented in through strategies, and then how do we sustain it over time? So the science is very important in our work forward as nurses. I'm going to put you through a little case of Dr. Ludington. So as a very uh, prominent professor here at the Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing, she is uh, very uh, prominent in kangaroo care and influencing this movement of evidence into practice. And so back in uh, years ago, she started her work in efficacy trials, looking at that impact of kangaroo care on outcomes. And so she spent years demonstrating the efficacy of this. And then she published a systematic review on all of her trials showing the efficacy and effectiveness of kangaroo care on outcomes. And this is her publication of her systematic review. Then uh, clinical practice guidelines were formed in order to help nurses across the country and other professionals for implementing kangaroo care into practice. Then what happened was there was implementation of those clinical practice guidelines into care delivery. And so you can see some of the publications demonstrating this um, implementation of kangaroo care into practice. And yet there still was gaps. There still was an opportunity to learn how can we implement kangaroo care to every mother and baby every time to ensure that reliability of care delivery. And so we needed research then to help us, to guide us. What were some of the barriers and facilitators for that implementation of kangaroo care in, into delivery? Um, and then also to maybe run some efficacy trial or randomized control trials on strategies that could help nurses to reliably deliver kangaroo care to every patient or dyad every time. So that case study, I, I just love because Dr. Ludington is at our School of Nursing uh, and uh, it's just wonderful to see this trajectory of research move from that efficacy trial all the way to implementation. Um, so in implementation research, there are many different types of research and you can see here uh, showing this efficacy again in the middle of the tube, moving to effectiveness studies and then implementation research. And in the uh, yellow then at the top of the screen, you can see that the beginning of implementation studies are really observational, oftentimes qualitative, really trying to understand the context and the, um, and the provider influence and the patient influence on this work. Then implementation science can move to more intervention work where we're doing trials on different strategies in order to determine what strategy really helps us to move that evidence into practice. This is a very prominent uh, model in implementation research by Proctor, uh, demonstrating again, at starting at the left, the evidence-based practice of which you're trying to implement or the um, intervention strategy. But then what we are really interested in in implementation science are those implementation strategies. What is it that we can do to the environment to ensure reliable uptake of the intervention list kangaroo care? What kinds of organizational strategies or factors can assist? Um, what kinds of individual strategies can we do, such as um, audit and feedback or um, education or champions that can facilitate this uptake. The outcomes in implementation science are also a bit different. Uh, we do look at the very right at the client outcomes as we do in traditional research or you know, prior to the implementation science. And we also look at these implementation outcomes. What's the feasibility of the implementation strategy that we're looking at or the fidelity? How, how accurate can we be in delivering these implementation strategies? What's the penetration look like or the acceptability, the sustainability and the uptake and the costs? So these are the outcomes of interest in implementation science. Sometimes it gets a little confusing. And even when we teach the course, there is a real switch in people's um, uh, prior, um, I think, mental models of research. 
Um, and so Curran has developed this very simple non-scientific language to help with that switch of thinking um, into implementation uh, research. Um, and what, how he describes it is the intervention or the practice or the innovation or the kangaroo care, as we saw in the example, is the thing. Um, the effectiveness research looks at whether that thing works. So when Dr. Ludington did her work, her randomized control trials, she determined that kangaroo care did impact the outcomes. Implementation research looks at how best to help people or things do the thing. So it's how we get the providers to deliver that kangaroo care every time. Implementation strategies are the stuff that we do to try to help people or places do the thing. So that would mean what can we do about the environment to cue the providers to do the kangaroo care. And then the main implementation outcomes are how much and how well do they do that thing? So did they really uptake the kangaroo care in, a, in the delivery for, uh, of care for mothers? And the components of implementation research, it's really uh, burgeoning. It's maybe about 25 years old and there are over 90 theories now uh, to help and guide our work. Um, and as far as the implementation strategies, there's been uh, some compilations of those, and I think they have uh, identified about 73 different kinds of strategies that we need to test to determine what is going to help us to implement that evidence into practice. The methods also are usually mixed, and we usually always include qualitative and quantitative methods. And we always attend to the context. So what is happening in the context of care delivery that is impacting the uptake? And another unique feature of implementation research is it's multi-level, uh, looking at both the patient, the provider, the organization, uh, the unit. And so it's uh, usually a multi-level uh, design. So some of you may not be researchers and maybe practice oriented, but how do we use implementation science in practice? Well, we really need to be attentive to what is being published in implementation science so that we can use these theories and these strategies to help guide our practice change. And so with our DMP students at the Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing, we promote that in the EBP projects that they're, they're looking at these theories and these strategies and using them in their, their um, evidence-based projects. So all of this research, evidence-based practice, quality improvement all start with a practice problem. And so I'd like for all of you to think about what evidence-based practice do you want to implement? So in the care that you deliver, think about what's the gap, what's missing? And I'd like for you now to just take a few minutes to think about a practice problem that interests you. And then I'd like for you to participate in what we call a chatter fall. And that means that I'm gonna have you put into the chat box your practice problem that you would like to study, but don't submit this, the chat yet. And so the chatter fall occurs after we give everyone a few, a few seconds to put in your practice problem in the chat box. And then I'll say, okay, one, two, three, release. And then you can release your answer. And then we're going to watch everybody's chatter, you know, come to life. I love this strategy because um, it allows everyone to think uniquely about what practice problem or, you know, whatever they would like to put into the chat and not be influenced by others' thoughts. Um, and then we can kind of look to see how that evolves. So we'll give everyone a little minute to do that. And I'm going to pull up my chat box just to kind of watch. All right. So we'll go five, four, three, two, one, hit the button and we'll see the chat. Oh, whoa. All right. Uh, Beth, best methods to encourage nurse self-care. Oh, what a great topic for now. You are right. How do we take care of ourselves during COVID? Um, inpatient disaster preparedness. Excellent topic. Get rid of verbal orders. Wow. Good safety issue. Um, con consistent use of evidence-based dyspnea tool. Wow, that's an excellent evidence-based practice implementation project. Home med instruction, active learning strategies, work best in DMP programs. All right, well, that was fun. That was fun to watch. 
And uh, kudos to all of you for identifying such great practice problems uh, that lead you, uh, will lead you forward in a positive way in implementation work into the future. So thank you for sharing in that Shatterfall. Now I'd like to just share um, our first presenter and she is a Hirsch Fellow uh, from 2018 to 2021 and it's Dr. Tong Yao Wang. And she's gonna share a little bit about her journey as a Hirsch Fellow the last three years. So Dr. Wang. Thank you, uh, Dr. Delansky and, um, and good afternoon to everyone. And uh, my name is Tong Yao and I'm an oncology nurse before I started um, back in school as a Hirsch Fellow and a doctoral student. And um, my research interests are really in ensuring uh, patient, uh, to uh, help ensure patients implement evidence-based uh, strategy through the use of pictograph when they go home uh, to, to do their self-care, uh, especially in this uh, in my dissertation study um, for their uh, 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 independently performed tracheostomy care at home. And um, uh, my other uh, research in interests include uh, standardize the pictograph development and validation process and test the pictograph um, intervention to improve uh, self-efficacy on health management. Um, so I was very lucky to work with uh, Dr. Voss and Dr. Uh, Delansky as a Hirsch Fellow to conduct um, evidence-based uh, research project and system, uh, sy systematic literature review to understand up-to-date um, evidence. Um, so the research project include uh, testing the impact of weather conditions on physical activity status um, in people living with HIV, uh, develop and validate the patients uh, with head and neck cancer, uh, and um, and uh, it's a preliminary efficacy of the pictographic uh, education handout. Uh, in addition, we have published three out of the four li literature uh, reviews, including looking at the needs of informal caregivers of patients with head and neck cancer during uh, the survivorship, um, look at the effectiveness of pictographs on improving patient education outcomes, and understanding the information overload during patient education uh, and the symptom, symptom uh, sign status of nurse initiated intervention for uh, sleep disturbances uh, in people living with a HIV. Um, so here's my uh, dissertation study model uh, is to develop and validate a pictographic education handout on tracheostomy care, uh, which was funded by the International Sigma Nursing Foundation. Uh, the study has uh, three uh, stages, a uh, development, uh, revisions, and field testing. So the development stage include uh, building an expert panel, develop the pictorial handout, and the handout evaluation instrument. Uh, the, the revision stage refers to the iterative process of handout evaluation and revision by the expert panel and the user panel. Um, and then we recruited 22 patients and 17 caregivers to field test the handout. Uh, we also adopted a pre and post intervention design to test the efficacy of the pictographs. Patients and caregivers were asked to report their self-efficacy scores immediately after they give consent to the study. And then I briefly reviewed the handout with them and gave them the study survey. The very last question in the survey asked them to report their self-efficacy again um, after they reviewed the uh, pictographic handout. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the study also collected information to look at risk factors uh, related with uh, lower self-efficacy. Um, so next slide, please. So um, as a clinical nurse, um, uh, the, the clinical issue uh, I found was my patient cannot read the text-based handout sheets um, I give them in the hospital. So I drafted it on the pink sheet and uh, he was immediately much more confident and competent. So um, um, as a Hirsch Fellow, I wanted to uh, standardize the process of making the handout and validate the pictographic handout. So this could be made more available to future patients and family caregivers uh, who need to perform uh, evidence-based tracheo tracheostomy care at home. And uh, next slide, please. Um, so overall, um, overall, the, the study helped us to have a better understanding of the patient education phenomena on tracheostomy care. Uh, on the left side with the solid lines are the significant factors associated with self-efficacy on tracheostomy care. And on the right side, where, uh, the dashed lines are the non-significant factor we found in our hypothesized model. 
we found uh, five factors, anxiety, cognition preference, uh, comorbidities, age, and your health literacy uh, level uh, together explain 88% of the variance in self-efficacy. Um, uh, depression, uh, PTSD related to tracheostomy, um, social emotional quality of life, psychological symptom distress, and global symptom distress all showed a moderate correlation with self-efficacy, but did not st state in the regression model. This is mostly because they were uh, highly correlated with anxiety level. And uh, these moderate to strong correlation, in addition to anxiety, indicate that we should really pay more attention to support their psychological needs in order to improve their self-efficacy level. Um, and for patient-specific variable, uh, we found that there, there's a distinct difference between the impact of psychological distress and the physical distress. There's no correlation uh, between physical symptom dis distress and the self-efficacy. Um, and then, um, we also analyzed the difference on the participant self-efficacy on tracheostomy care before and after the intervention. We found the intervention actually showed a clinical significance with the medium uh, effect size. Next slide, please. So um, future implementation project that needs to be conducted for uh, um, after this study, we think include uh, the implementation of routine assessment of self-efficacy and anxiety at a follow-up appointment, uh, follow-up education and competency assessment for patients and caregivers at outpatient appointments. Um, also to identify barriers and facilitators of the implementation of pictograph for tracheostomy care. And lastly, um, development and, and implement pictograph for patients with high anxiety and, uh, and those who prefer simple um, education formats. Great, well, congratulations on this great work and all of your work during the Hirsch Fellowship. Um, I believe that you have achieved uh, improvement in patient outcomes um, and have really accelerated ideas for future work in implementation science. Um, I think this demonstrates the need for qualitative uh, work forward and quantitative work forward. So congratulations, Dr. Wang, and thank you so much for presenting. And now we're going to uh, have Chanel Hill, who's our second fellow currently um, in the fellowship. Um, Chanel? Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Chanel Hill, and as Dr. Delansky just stated, I'm a I'm new Hirsch Fellow. Um, I came over to um, CASE by way of the Bridges to Doctorate program. Um, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, our implementation science course and how that helped me to um, hone in on my research um, study that I will be um, doing for this PhD program. So advance to the next slide, please. So just a little bit about me. Um, this is my second year as a PhD nursing student at CASE. Um, as I stated, I came through as a Bridges Scholar. Um, I'm master's prepared and I have 15 years of critical care experience. Um, I also have a certification as a nurse educator. Um, and my focus is implementation science and I'm looking at mobility in the critical care environment. Move on to the next slide. So our nursing implementation science class uh, was a great uh, class for me, and it really helped um, to elevate uh, my research project. In the class, um, we get exposure to many different speakers, and um, we have scientists come in to present their work. Um, so we're exposed to different designs in the implementation um, project process and different theories that you can use. Um, there's also abundance of web resources um, and, and written resources that we have uh, for implementation science as well. Um, I was also exposed to the Implementation Science Journal, which has um, many different works in there of how these uh, different strategies can be tested. Um, I also learned that it's important to build your network and connect with others in implementation science um, and find out what kind of things they're working on and how you can collaborate your research with them. Um, in this class, we also were able to do a personal implementation project, uh, which really highlighted how challenging it can be um, to enact change, uh, which is really a, a reason why implementation science is so important. 
um, the class actually went over grant writing and I had the opportunity to apply for a grant, an evidence-based practice grant um, through Ohio State University. Um, still waiting on the results of that, um, keeping fingers crossed, um, but it was a great experience. Uh, my first time writing a grant, uh, which is a pretty tedious process. And then one of the most important lessons I learned from the implementation course is that your pre-implementation work is so key in your project, um, especially if you want something successful and something that is gonna um, be adaptable to the environment that you're working in. So um, that pre-work is has to be strong and it, it's very important um, for your research. So you can go on to the next slide. So this is just a picture of how I feel like this class has kind of elevated my research and helped me to take my research to the next level and actually have um, a project that is um, appropriate for the environment um, that I'm trying to work in. We can go to the next slide. So a little bit about uh, my research area, uh, my practice problem here is, is surrounding mobility. Um, so I work in a CVICU. Um, so immobility is one of the leading causes of post-operative complications after open heart surgery. And although we know that early and progressive mobility mitigates complications, we're still having um, a challenging time starting mobility in the critical care environment. Um, we're having patients that are discharged to rehab, um, patients that are um, having problems such as atelectasis and respiratory insufficiency, um, patients that are um, ha having thrombosis, things like that that we know um, per evidence uh, can be mitigated with early and progressive mobility, especially environments where patients spend 48 to 72 hours in that um, CVICU environment and do not transition to step down uh, quickly. <clears throat> and we can see and that doing a little pre-work in the environment, mobility is ordered um, three times a day, but uh, patients were only mobilized once on average in that particular environment. So it's very important to try to figure out ways to increase the mobility, uh, find out what the barriers and facilitators are um, so that we can have patients mobilizing um, as much as they should and mitigating these complications um, that come with bed rest. <clears throat> so in uh, my original project, when I came into this, um, this Hirsch Fellowship, I wanted to use patient and family engagement, which is one of the 73 strategies that Dr. Delansky talked about um, that was derived from the ERIC um, research. And um, my intervention was going to be a mobility goal board to kind of set goals for the patient, include the patient in setting those goals. And hopefully that would um, increase um, movements of the patient. But when I went ahead and did that um, pre-implementation work and did my environment scan and looked at those different uh, barriers and facilitators in the particular environment, as well as um, doing a survey of stakeholders, they really felt that this intervention would not be appropriate for their particular environment. So doing um, this pre-implementation work, I found that for this particular area, the best intervention seems to be to have a mobility technician. And that ERIC strategy would be um, creating a new clinical care team. So will we be adding the mobility technician onto the team? Um, to help with that. And I was actually very surprised because of the um, financial aspect or the cost aspect that there was so much buy-in from um, the directors um, that I actually um, surveyed when I was doing this uh, pre-implementation work. Um, the class also um, helped me understand the importance of finding the correct theory to use um, to frame all of your research and um, the consolidated framework for implementation research theory um, is the one that I've chosen for this particular project. Um, that particular theory looks at the intervention itself, um, breaks down how complicated is this intervention? Is it gonna be um, difficult for patients? Is it going to be difficult for um, your healthcare staff? 
It also looks at your inner and outer environment um, and how that affects being able to implement your strategy. I um, mean, your inner um, environment being the culture of that unit, if you have buy-in from your management team, and then outer being more of the environment itself. Um, such as with mobility, uh, where are the walkers stored? Is it um, easy to navigate a walk through the particular unit? It's also looking at the characteristics of the individuals um, that will be participating in the particular intervention. So how do um, nurses see mobility? Do they see it as something important for patient care? Um, and uh, so their knowledge and attitudes is very important to understand uh, when you're going into um, uh, uh, implementing a change on a unit. And then it also looks at the implementation process itself. Um, how is the implementation going? How are we going to sustain um, this particular intervention so that mobility continues to happen? And then the um, method that we want to use um, or design is the hybrid three. And that is because we're going to be looking at implementation outcomes such as uh, feasibility, adaptability, sustainability, and cost, as well as looking at outcome measures. Does having this mobility technician actually increase um, the, the times that patients are mobilized in that particular unit? Next slide, please. And then I also wanted to share um, some of the lessons that I learned during the personal um, implementation project, which when I first thought about it, I thought would, would be pretty easy, but um, change in behavior is actually very challenging. Um, and, and reasons for resistance to change is multifaceted. Um, so it's not always a, a one size fits all type of intervention. Um, we have to always think about um, the environment that we're trying to, to make change in um, and how we have to tailor our um, interventions and strategies to that particular environment. And we, um, we must understand the underlying barriers, um, like why are we resistant to change to be able to successfully change behaviors. And then the work continues after you have that particular um, change in place, it's very easy to go back to old ways. So uh, we can't let um, comfortableness set in and we have to uh, remember to think of ways to sustain the change. And then we always wanna remember the importance of why we're doing this change because in many instances, the reward that we're looking for, the outcome that we're looking for is not always immediate. So it's very important to keep remembering why we're doing this um, until we can realize that change. So Great. thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you, Chanel, for sharing your science. I thought it was uh, important for our audience to hear about the projects that are being done to give a flavor for the concepts uh, and methods that are being used in implementation science currently. Notably, sustainability and scalability are huge uh, areas of advancing the science. Uh, uh, because those are also big gaps in care delivery. Our last uh, Hirsch Fellow who is just starting this year is Pamela Bolton, and she's interested in operationalizing circadian rhythm interventions in the critical care environment. So we're looking forward to working with Pamela uh, in the next uh, year. So we've done the Hirsch history, uh, a brief view of implementation science and heard some great science from our emerging new fellows. Um, and uh, the opportunities are important for us to share with you tonight. And where can you get more training if this is something of interest to you? And there is a lot of training out there that is actually free. This is a wonderful website. Um, the Training Institute for Dissemination, Implementation, Research in Cancer. Uh, cancer is really one of the leading um, areas or disciplines in this field, uh, along with uh, mental health and pu public health. Um, I will, at the end of this uh, series, um, send you all a resource page with all of these resources uh, so that you have them for your future uh, reference. Uh, also want you to know that we do have courses at Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing. We have Nursing 412, which is a one credit, um, really clinical experience where you participate um, in evidence-based practice implementation and quality improvement methods uh, to facilitate effective management of practice change. So if you want to dip your toes into this area, this would be the course to take being offered this summer. 
Also at uh, the Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing, we integrate implementation science into all of our courses at the BSN level, the MSN, the MN, the DNP, and uh, we offer a course on implementation science in the PhD program that's offered in uh, this sum the summer of 2022. Also, this content is being delivered in the clinical translational doctoral, doctoral program um, as another uh, interprofessional um, piece. I also want you all to know that there we have locally uh, access to the national uh, VA Quality Scholars Program, which is a two-year fellowship uh, that focuses on uh, implementation science, also focuses on quality improvement, if that is your area of interest in operations and leadership, and also in teaching. Um, and it is a wonderful fellowship for nurses. It can be a pre-doctoral fellowship, um, two years with a stipend, um, and or it can be a postdoctoral fellowship. So again, in our area here in Cleveland, we are really promoting the next generation of nurse scientists in implementation research. There are also many global opportunities to learn more about implementation science if you're interested globally in public health, infectious disease. This research on um, this uh, website has um, a massive open online course or a MOOC on implementation research for infectious diseases, but another great way to learn about implementation science. Also, another area that has emerged in the past two years is the University of Maryland. They were funded by the state of Maryland to, um, to learn about how to best deliver implementation science in their DMP programs throughout the state. And so Deborah Bingham is the principal investigator of this work, uh, and she actually has many um, webinars that are available for, re for review. Um, and this last one was just really very important because it talked about racial equity and justice um, is an implementation strategy um, and tactics for DNP projects to always um, include this area um, in their in the work forward. The other uh, piece of uh, opportunity is to publish. Uh, notably, the World Views on Evidence-Based Nursing just published a themed issue on implementation science to advance evidence-based practice. Um, and Molly McThett, who some of you may know from Metro Health, um, who is now is a, a faculty member at The Ohio State University, she was the editor for this special issue. Um, and then we published one of our works from our funded study with the John A. Hartford Foundation on the implementation of the evidence-based age-friendly health systems movement into the multi-state convenient care minute clinics. Um, and so this was a pre-implementation publication uh, demonstrating uh, the, 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 the point that I think Chanel made is the real importance of getting into the organization and understanding um, that organization uh, in order to really tailor the, the intervention for that organization. Another great opportunity is conference, and the main conference for this area is the Dissemination and Implementation Conference that is offered by Academy Health in collaboration with the National Institute of Health uh, and the VA. And this is in its 14th year last year. Um, interestingly, the first time I went, there were about 100 people at the conference. I think I went to the third one, and now they're up to about 1,400 people attending this conference, demonstrating the enthusiasm uh, of this topic and type of research currently. And now there's a lot of funding in this area. So here's an example of potential funding from the Fogarty International, that there are also many opportunities for funding at NIH. There's um, R01s, R21s, R03s. And um, I think that many of the National Institutes of Health are very interested in implementation science, notably the NHLBI, the NIA. And I've heard that the NINR is soon to be um, opening up that uh, opportunity for uh, nursing. There's also a lot of implementation science grants that are up on the web. Um, here's a nice website that does have, I think about, I don't know, seven or 10 implementation grants. Because again, it is a different uh, lens on the work that we do. And having a sample grant really helps uh, to get your uh, funding going. And now the, the, the clinical translational science centers or the CTSCs or the CTSAs are really getting on the bandwagon uh, in implementation science. Notably, they are translational um, centers. Uh, and uh, this one I wanted to note was the University of Colorado. They have, um, they're one of the first ones really focusing on implementation science. 
Um, and so th they have a lot of very good resources on their site and also an annual conference. There are also publication guidelines, uh, just as we have the consort guidelines for intervention research, there are the STAR uh, guidelines for publishing implementation science. Um, and there's also a journal, um, the Journal of Implementation Science, which is open access, and it just is a very a good resource for uh, reading about those science. And so uh, with that, we then tonight looked at the Hirsch history of uh, the uh, implementation science brief, had a couple of examples from our great fellows. Thank you again to uh, Chanel and Tang Yao. Um, and then we also reviewed some opportunities for you to uh, look at other ways to learn more about implementation science or ways to be funded or ways to get published. Um, and notably, these opportunities are open for PhD prepared or DNP prepared or MSN. I really believe that at any level uh, of nursing, the implementation science information is so important for us for change. And we all know that change is the essence of what we do in nursing so that we can always not just deliver the care that we were uh, educated to do, but also to look at that system and be open to changing the system of care so that we can ensure that care is always of high quality and safe. So with that, I'd just like to open up to see if there are any questions in the chat box or if anyone would like to unmute your mic to ask any questions. Uh, I would be happy to entertain um, comments, questions. And I'll let Maria then cue me if she sees any questions coming across. Um, or you can also use the Q&A. Uh, one, one, while you're thinking, one question that I often get is, well, where's the intersection between implementation science and quality improvement? Um, and that is a really great question. Um, I would like to first talk a little bit about quality improvement and research. Um, in that with quality improvement, the interventions and the intent is local. It's, um, it's that the interventions that we do for quality improvement are to improve care at, the, at a unit or a hospital. Um, the intention is not to uh, discover new knowledge um, or to generalize what we find. It's really to understand that local environment, to test some possible change strategies, um, and then see the effect that it has. And then if we do find some good strategies that assist, then to sustain those strategies. Usually, usually quality improvement includes implementation of, of evidence-based practice, but then also can include other types of change, such as um, improving the efficiency of care delivery or improving um, the um, maybe access to care or processes of care. Um, and so the, the scope of the practice problems can be a little more wide um, and more encompassing than uh, the practice problems of evidence-based practice, which are focused mainly on the gaps where evidence is not being implemented into practice. And so quality improvement um, is different from research in that component of research is really to um, generalize and discover new knowledge and quality improvement is to do local change back to the difference between implementation and quality improvement is that I think at the practice level, implementation um, is very similar to quality improvement if you're only trying to improve care at the local level and you're not trying to discover new knowledge and you're not trying to generalize what you're finding at that local level. But where um, Im implementation science gets different is when it's research. When you are definitely setting up a study with a design and methods in order to discover the newness or the, the factors that are important in that implementation of that evidence. Um, and so we're in implementation research, we're discovering new knowledge and generalizing it. Um, and so that would be the differences between um, implementation research um, and thinking about quality improvement um, and then implementation practice. So. That's one question that comes up a lot. But definitely, if you have quality improvement, skill, or enthusiasm, that will serve you well in this work of implementing evidence into practice. 
Did that inspire anyone to ask a question on the chat? Yes, Maria. Yeah, that's a question. Great. Um, how does environment complicate sustainability and scalability? The environment. All right, the environment is a key factor. Our founding uh, mother of nursing, Florence Nightingale, knew all about the environment and really studied the environment. And I think as nurses, we need to open our lenses to what is happening in the environment. Um, and the environmental factors are key uh, to sustainability. Um, what we've learned in implementation science is that many of these strategies need to be hardwired into our workflow. Um, and therefore with the um, EPIC, um, one example of this uh, is where they put alerts into the electronic health record to alert people to do things um, or remind them. Now that has sort of in some regards created some fatigue, alert fatigue, and that now they've overused that strategy and we get way too many alerts. Um, and so now we probably have to study that a bit to determine what's the threshold for alerts. I think that we also have to include context in a lot that we, in many of our research studies, I think uh, Chanel had mentioned the culture and the climate of the environment, the leadership of the environment. These are key factors in um, implementation of evidence into practice um, that cannot be ignored um, and that must be included and must be um, um, articulated as important and essential um, in our work in healthcare. Um, and then as far as, I think the, the question also was that sustainability and how environment is important for sustainability, but I think it's also important in scalability um, that we have to understand the differences in the context or the environments of each unit that we do these um, implementation projects in, because every unit could be a little different and needing a little adjustment in, in um, the intervention itself. So those are really great questions and really demonstrating the complexity of this science. Great. All right. Well, I won't keep you. I know it's Nurses Day, the first day of Nurses uh, Month or uh, in celebration. So I know you all want to uh, have a nice celebration tonight, have a glass of wine after this mm -hmm. session. I do want to remind you that there are continuing professional development credit, one credit for this session. Um, if you complete the evaluation and Maria will put that link in the chat box for all of you. Um, and then as a reminder, I will also send you a resource list with all the different resources that we included in the talk tonight. So you'd have those for your um, reference. So again, we want to thank you. A reminder on the CUSIN conference, we do have the virtual conference that's going currently and a great live session. Uh, June 1st, we're highlighting um, Kathy McGuinn from the AACN who will give, be giving a talk on the new re-envisioned essentials, the competency-based um, essentials. And then we will also have a cooking demonstration uh, of, a lovely, of a lovely dinner uh, by Dr. Dean, uh, by our Dean Musel, and also the Dean of uh, Ursuline, Dr. Patricia Sharpnick. Um, so please join us on June 1st, or also join us on uh, June 2nd, where we have a whole day of, of sessions, workshops, some talking about implementation science and quality and safety, um, very inspirational uh, conference. So we would like to invite you all to that. So thank you again for attending tonight. And we wish you again, a very lovely month of May celebrating nursing. <laughs>